Good evening. My name is Ted Landsmark. I am a professor of uh, policy within the School of uh, Public Policy here at uh, Northeastern University. Um, you've joined the open classroom starting just a few minutes late tonight. Uh, and this semester we've been focusing on environmental justice and uh, community engagement. And our speaker tonight, uh, a uh, colleague uh, uh, who was back uh, a while and has been uh, deeply engaged in uh, mobilizing communities to uh, some of the challenges of uh, climate change uh, and uh, environmental degradation in our neighborhoods. Uh, our speaker tonight uh, is the Reverend Vernon Walker. He will introduce himself and his program. Um, we will um, continue uh, our Wednesday evening series up until uh, the week before Thanksgiving, and then we'll be back uh, for several weeks uh, in December as well. And I want to provide a quick heads up for the fact that we are uh, putting together a conference, which will be held um, partially here on campus uh, on uh, Friday, November 4th, and uh, partly at the um, MAP Library, uh, the Leventhal MAP Library uh, at the Boston Public Library on Saturday, November 5th. Um, those are open to the public, and you will hear uh, more uh, details of this conference addressing uh, the rising tide of um, community engagement with issues of environmental justice. Uh, but with that, um, I'm going to turn the microphone over to my colleague, uh, the Reverend Vernon Walker. All right, all right. It's so good to be here tonight uh, among, this, uh, among so many curious learners tonight. Uh, it's, it's, it's always good to be among some Huskies. We got a few Huskies in the building tonight, and I'm, I'm just really elephant happy and peacock proud to be here. Uh, with you all. And uh, one thing we will we'll try to do is not bore you tonight, uh, but ensure that you walk away with something. And I know we will have an opportunity to do a Q&A with Dr. Landmark, and I'm looking forward to that. But I just want to take a few minutes of your time to just share a little bit about uh, the organization that I am with, uh, Communities Responding to Extreme Weather, where I serve as the program director uh, and our offices are in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, right on uh, Harvard's campus. And we're really, you know, when I have an opportunity to do talks uh, such as this, I'm always uh, elated by the fact that people are taking climate change seriously. Uh, I know we live in a world where there's so many threats to our civil freedom. We live uh, so, so many threats to our uh, social liberties and so many atrocities happening in the world that particularly and invariably that we oftentimes as a people forget that climate change is real and what I believe, it is the greatest existential threat to our human existence. And we will explain a little bit throughout this PowerPoint uh, why it is such. Uh, so I do bring you greetings on the behalf of crew uh, and for my colleagues that could not be here tonight. We, we, we're sending our, uh, we're, they're sending their greetings uh, that they're, that you all, that we are glad to be here at Northeastern. So let's start with what CREW is. CREW is uh, an acronym for Communities Responding to Extreme Weather. And uh, tonight I have brought a uh, PowerPoint with me uh, to help for our learners who like visual uh, aids and things of that nature. So we're going to try to cater to you as well as to those who learn best uh, through, uh, through audio. Uh, so, CREW, otherwise Communities Responding to Extreme Weather, is a grassroots organization that aims to build equitable, inclusive neighborhood climate resilience 
in Massachusetts and New England through hands-on education, service, and planning. Before we go on, I'd like to elucidate a little bit about the climate movement and the different lanes in the climate movement. Uh, you, how many, by show of hands, how many people here are familiar with the Green New Deal, or at least have heard of the Green New Deal? Well, uh, the Green New Deal is a set of economical policies designed to help society transition off of fossil fuel, coal, and gas. Uh, it was Senator Ed Markey and uh, and uh, U.S. Rep. or Ale uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, who introduced this particular framework in 2019, uh, in early 2019, perhaps around February 2019, of the Green New Deal. And the Green New Deal is an example of what we call mitigation. Uh, and we'll go into a little bit of that a little later during this presentation. Uh, but when you hear about efforts such as reducing our carbon footprint, or you hear about efforts uh, around plastic, uh, plastic ban use, or you hear about efforts such as going and using uh, uh, electric vehicles and, and transitioning off cars that use uh, uh, gas, this is all part of mitigation. This is all part of we need to slow the climate crisis down because it is real, it is scary, and it is interconnected. Well, what do you mean by interconnected? I'm so glad you asked tonight. Uh, what we mean by interconnected is that the climate crisis and climate change does not stand alone as a separate entity. It is connected to housing, jobs, the economy, uh, labor, civic rights, et cetera. I'll give you an example. Unfortunately, we had Hurricane Ian last week, knocked out power in Cuba for a, a couple weeks. Uh, a couple weeks ago, rather, it knocked out power for 11 million residents in Cuba. Uh, it also devastated Naples, Florida, also Fort, Myer, Fort Myers, Florida. It has left in its path a level of devastation that people were not expecting to see. Uh, as a result, folks who live in Naples, Florida, folks who live in Fort Myers, Florida, suffered the unimaginable tragedy of losing their home. Similarly enough, when we think about Hurricane Katrina in 2005, we think about thousands of homes decimated because of the hurricane. Well, this is a prime example of how climate change is connected to housing justice and stable housing, and therefore it leads to the term uh, climate refugees. Because when people's homes and their livelihoods, or their homes and, and the place that they lay their head has been destroyed because of an extreme weather, uh, then, then they therefore have to migrate and find a new a bo a place to of rest. Uh, so at any rate, to come back to climate mitigation, so some of the, so some of the uh, previous examples are mitigation efforts. When I mentioned about the Green New Deal and pushing for a plastic ban and pushing for the use of uh, uh, electric vehicles, these are examples of mitigation. Then there is the approach of abdication, and abdication says we know that these things are going to happen because climate change is not a new phenomenon. Climate change has been happening since the Industrial Revolution. In fact, the planet's temperature has been warming up greatly since the Industrial Revolution, and it coincides with human beings' reliance on fossil fuels, coal, and gas. So that's really what I want to spend a few minutes on tonight, is to talk about adaptation and the need for organizations like CREW. So, why CREW? The problem, climate change is already impacting our communities. Connected to that, climate change is complex and overwhelming. 
Further to exacerbate the issue, climate action is limited because of partisan divide. And unfortunately, climate change has been very politicized in our culture and in our world today, when the reality of it is that it should not be a left issue, it should not be a right issue, but it's a moral issue. It's an issue where if we, I believe, if we do not work together, black, white, brown, Democrat, Republican, independent, if we do not work together, then the amounts of storms and the amounts of, of extreme weather will come quicker than we're able to adapt to it and will become, and will become a lot more intense. So what's the solution? So we see the problems here. So part of the solution is building community resilience through concrete service and action. One of the chief functions of crew is to build social resilience and connections in, the, in a given community, particularly communities that are what's called environmental justice communities. And we're going to go over environmental justice communities and what that really means in just a few minutes. Uh, but I just really wanted to point out the why the need for crew, because climate change, extreme weather is already here, y'all. Even Stevie Wonder can see it. Uh, so if even Stevie Wonder can see it, y'all, it ought to be as clear as day that we got a problem. And we got a problem that if we don't slow down our reliance on fossil fuels, coal, and gas, this problem is going to continue to get much worse and worse. And what type of planet will we be living in when you're 80 or 90? Will we have a society? Will we have a planet to call home? Will we be on planet Earth? Uh, so these are real existential questions that I know in the everyday hustle and bustle of life, we don't really get, an, a lot of us don't get the opportunity to think about, but these are very real questions. So let's talk about our model, education, service, and planning. So a lot of what we do at CREW, uh, and I should back up, CREW was started in 2018. Uh, I had the privilege of coming to CREW in 2019. And when, when I came to CREW, CREW was in its nascent stages. It was in its very, very humble beginnings. Uh, and was not on the slide, but CREW is a, officially a program under the Better Future Project which is a larger nonprofit that also houses another program called uh, 350 Mass. Remember I mentioned a little earlier about the mitigation approach and the adaptation approach? And by the way, I think you need both. It shouldn't be this or that. It should be this and that. Because the reality of it is that we ought to stop climate change and stop le leaning on fossil fuels and, and slow down our dependence on fossil fuels, as well as preparing people for heat waves, preparing folks for floods, droughts, et cetera. Because as we mentioned, this climate change is not a new phenomenon. Uh, and it will be here, and, and the effects of climate change are going to continue, continuously be felt. So our model, our model is conducting outreach, hosting workshops, and attending conferences on climate impacts and conducting research. If you are curious, we have just published some research, actually it's on the uh, United Nations website now, uh, around social connections and extreme weather. We, uh, CREW has partnered with Tufts University, which is not too far from here, and we published a, res uh, a report uh, looking in Chinatown and Roxbury and Grove Hall, and we looked at what do people do in times of extreme weather crisis. I actually want to go back in time a little bit. 
uh, maybe some of you might not, some of you may remember and some of you might not remember. In 1995, there was a five day heat wave in Chicago that killed 739 people. Check that out, y'all. 739 people died because of a five day heat wave in Chicago. That's brutal, deep, and devastating. Uh, there was a research done around that that uh, uh, by a sociologist named Eric Klingenberg, who's a professor at uh, NYU. And uh, essentially, his research suggested that uh, he went block by block to do an analysis. And his research suggested that people that are socially connected to each other, for instance, neighbors that know each other, neighbors that are checking in during that particular heat wave, were less likely to die because they had someone reaching out to them and seeing what they needed, seeing if they needed to go to a cooling center, seeing if they needed to come over to their houses because maybe they didn't have AC, seeing if they needed uh, some additional the extra bottles of water because they were, could not afford water. Uh, so what we see is the, the disparity uh, in his study, in his book, it's called, and also his, his research turned into a book. It is named, it's, uh, the, it's called the, uh, the, uh, the, the Autopsy of the Chicago Heat Wave. Uh, the social autopsy of the Chicago heat wave. If you're ever interested in that, not like you don't have enough books to read already, but if you're ever interested in that, uh, do check it out. I'm sure they probably have cliff notes somewhere online if you just want to get a little bit more of the summary takeaways than what we just have provided. So really, that's the genesis of Crew. So Crew came in existence in 2018 and, and uh, and looked at the landscape and said, well, wait a minute. There's no organization that's trying to, uh, on a grassroots level, trying to connect neighbors to each other. So through the process of time, then crew became formulated. And then there was this model. Uh, so in order for, for us, we have done workshops in Dorchester, Mattapan, Roxbury, Brockton, uh, and, and other places uh, because these communities have been hit the hardest, is hit the hardest by extreme weather. So in order to understand what the threat is, we, we show people, we have some, sli some slides that we'll go into uh, a little bit more, we show folks that this is the type of weather that's expected to impact your community. So education. That's one of our one of our areas. Service. So not only do we share education with people on on an intellectual cognitive level, but we have also provided resources. Uh, we have provided brand new energy efficient air conditioners over the last three summers to folks in Brockton. And this year, we also did Brockton, but we also did uh, Mattapan, Dorchester, and the, and, and the Lower South End. Uh, and we, we, we created a partnership with Mass General Hospital, and we targeted these communities. And, and Mass General Hospital funded this effort this year for the Boston Outreach to look and to target communities that would be underserved and under-resourced. So that's why, uh, when we go to underserved communities, we're bringing resources with us. It's kind of like Santa Claus, except for it's not Christmas, y'all. Uh, we're coming with gifts, and we're coming with gifts, food, and cooling kits. Uh, and if you haven't seen one of our cooling kits, uh, if you go to our website, climatecrew.org, and go to the media page, there's an article by, and we may can pull it up if we have if we have time. Uh, but you'll see a, a cooling kit, but. So we provide, we also, we don't, we just don't go quiet in the winter time. We also provide flood kits. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I had the privilege of being in East Boston uh, at an event that an uh, organization called NOAA uh, hosted called, and NOAA is an acronym for a Neighborhood of Affordable Housing Alliance. And they do a lot of work around sea level rise. Uh, and they also do a lot of work around housing. Uh, so they invited us, a uh, crew, to come out and we raffled off some cooling, some uh, winter kits. And winter kits are simply book bags that are, you can grab to go uh, in case your community is flooded or your house is flooded. 
Uh, East Boston is an example of a community that floods pretty often. And, and we got, you know, we'll show you some vis visual representation. All right, so let's talk about some of our values. Local leadership by people with specific community knowledge and resources, equity, addressing historical and structural inequality, service and action, we talked a little bit about that, emphasizing concrete and actionable, actionable initiatives, mutual benefit, building shared goals that advance health, sustainability, sustainability and equity, and collaboration with stakeholders from civic, public, and private sectors. So we have been blessed, y'all, to work with we, we have a component of our program called Climate Resilient Hubs, and hubs are organizations, independent organizations, that are serving some particular purpose in the community, whether it be educational, whether it be medical, whether it be emotional, social, et cetera. I'll give you an example. Uh, the Boston Nature Center in Mattapan, uh, that is one of our hubs, and we have a map on our website of hubs. We have, and, we have 110 hubs, 109 across the United States, and we have one in Canada, in Ontario, Canada. If you're curious about those hubs, please check out the website, but I'll just throw out some examples of who hubs are. Uh, hub, Michigan State University is, is a hub of ours. University of North Carolina is a hub of ours. I mentioned the Boston Nature Center is a hub of ours. Uh, Old South Church, which is in Back Bay, is a hub of ours, uh, et cetera. And we have tons of libraries. So we provide these hubs information on best practices to prepare for whatever extreme weather impacts the community. For instance, y'all, we have a hub in Georgetown, California. Some of y'all probably never heard of Georgetown, California. Don't worry, I didn't either until they, until they reached out. I'm like, oh, Georgetown, okay, we got a Georgetown, California. Georgetown, I, I hope anybody, is anybody here from Georgetown, California? Well, I guess y'all represent the majority of people. But uh, okay, that go here. So okay, we ain't got many folks from Georgetown. It's near Sacramento. Uh, and uh, so we, we, we created a lot of materials uh, that has been reviewed. So one of our partnerships, they're not a hub, but one of our partnerships was with the Mass General Hospital uh, Center for MGH, Center for Climate, oh, I'm drawing a blank on it. I actually sit on the advisory board and I can't remember the last name. Don't tell nobody. But, oh, this is recorded. Uh, MGH, I got love for y'all. But uh, I just can't remember. I just can't remember the last. Uh, so, but yeah, anyway, so it, uh, they have medically reviewed uh, our stuff. And, and, and so in Georgetown, California, we have a hub that's a library. So we have sent information on what to do in wildfires and drought. So we send material that's relevant to wherever uh, the institution is. Uh, Rice University in Houston is a hub of ours. And again, if you're interested in the hub, check out our website. Uh, and we have a whole big map and uh, under climate hubs. Uh, but I just wanted to touch on collaboration. We have worked uh, and we have been funded by the federal government, uh, NOAA, to do some community engagement projects over the last year. We have been funded by the state of Massachusetts, uh, the MVP grant. Uh, no, that's not, uh, that's not most valuable player. Uh, that in one sense it is, but the other MVP is Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness. It's a grant that uh, Governor Baker started, the Baker administration started for towns and cities in Massachusetts to assess their threat, their vulnerabilities to extreme weather. Uh, so we actually, uh, for the last two years, we've been working with the Charles River Watershed Association, uh, which covers the whole watershed uh, and engaging towns, and also working with an engineering firm, engaging citizens in towns about their, 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 their risk to flooding. Uh, so, um, so this is some of our values. So let's just talk a little bit. I just want to talk a little bit uh, with y'all, a little bit more, and then we'll, we'll then I'll head to my seat with uh, with Dr. Landmark, um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about hotter temperatures, more rain, and severe storm, and sea level rise. And and uh, for reference, this is referring to the city of Boston, where we are. So here, this is predicted for New England. If y'all can see, well, of course y'all can see this because this is a big screen here, uh, but look with me, if you will, 1971 to 2000, there was only 11 days of temperature over 90 degrees. 
If you look in the epoch where we are, in the frame of where we are, 2015 to 2044, we see that it is predicted to be over 30, degree, 30 days of temperature over 90 degrees. And if you look at 2055 to 2084, what we see here is that there will be over 60 days of temperature over 90 degrees. And I want to point out something. And if you're not from Boston or even this area, uh, the summertime here is June to August, 91 days. And we're talking about by 2084, for the folks who live here, that most of the summer could be brutally hot. Here's why, here's why that's important. Uh, so what I have here is the National Weather Service. This is a very interesting uh, bar graph here. And I want to point out something. I want to point out that we see a lot of different colors here. But the thing that is striking, at least in my mind, is heat. So what this is, this is fatalities by weather. And what we see here, so the 30-year average, 1992 to 2021, we see that there, on average, there was 158 people that died per year, every year in the United States. And in, in 2021 alone, 190 people died because of heat waves. And so you can see all these other weathers, flood, lightning, tornadoes, hurricanes, winter, cold, wind, grip currents. But we see here that heat is the most deadliest uh, extreme weather. And we'll touch on it in a little bit or why. But I just wanted to point out, and this is the National Weather Service here, uh, and you'll see that uh, lightning kills, flood kills, tornadoes, hurricanes, etc. But the most deadly of them all is, is heat. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about this map here. I want you to zoom in for a second. This is the city of Boston. This is Chelsea. This is Somerville. This is Watertown. This is Brookline. And I want you to kind of, I want you to, I want you to kind of look at this, this map for a second. All right, so, so you see all this orange stuff, y'all. So this represents what's called urban heat islands. And you'll see uh, Chelsea, you'll see a lot of cities. Now I'm going to come back to here. Somebody might be asking the question, well, what is an urban heat island? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Uh, neighborhoods with little tree cover, few grassy areas, and a lot of concrete can be as much as 15 to 20 degrees hotter than surrounding areas. The urban heat island effect, what does it do? It amplifies the heat waves already oppressive temperatures. Areas with a lot of asphalt buildings and freeways tend to absorb the sun energy and radiate heat. Areas with green space, such as parks, rivers, tree-lined streets, absorb less. So now let's come back. So let's put that in context of our map. Brookline, and I want you to see the, uh, the disparity here. Brookline is a traditionally wealthy white area. Lots of trees. You can see that there's a lot of blue because the blue corresponds to trees. Uh, and you see that... When we get down to Ashmont, when we get down, when we get down to Ashmont, right here, Ashmont is a neighborhood in Dorchester. You can see all, all that orangeness because that represents more concrete. So communities that have historically been disinvested black and brown, low income, urban communities are the communities that suffer the burden of, of climate change. So while climate change is the greatest existential threat to our human existence, there are certain communities that will, dis be, that will disproportionately 
faced the burdens of climate change because of being, histor because of being historically redlined and being historically disinvested. And unfortunately, these communities have been, as we mentioned, black and brown. And this is, this is Boston, but this is a trend across the United States. Uh, even if you look, uh, the city I'm originally from is Philadelphia, West Philadelphia, born and raised. That's where I spent most of my young days. Some of y'all might not catch that, but uh, watch the Fresh Prince and you'll catch it tomorrow. But uh, anyhow, Will Smith is also from, uh, Will Smith is also from West Philly. Uh, and, and thankfully, all of us don't go slapping people on stage. Uh, so we're so really grateful about that. Uh, some of us have a more calmer demeanor. Uh, anyhow, uh, Philadelphia is another city that has a lot of urban concrete. Y'all may have heard the song several years ago, uh, Concrete Jumble, Jungle, New York, right? Uh, well, New York is similar. So we can go through cities across the country and we will see the same trend that inner cities will look like this. If, uh, but uh, the reason that this is problematic, I, I wanna point out Logan Airport, East Boston, where the airport, East Boston is also an environmental justice community because jet fuel diesel is stored there with the airports. Uh, the community is also uh, at vulnerable to, fl uh, to risk to flood, but we'll get, into, we'll get into flooding in just a second. So really, I wanted to amplify, I wanted to amplify what are we looking at in Boston. And if we look somewhere around here, we may see Northeastern, we may be some, somewhere, the area that we are, because Roxbury's not too far from us. So some prop, in all likelihood, somewhere, somewhere right here, somewhere right here, is probably where we currently are right now. So again, the trend that I want to point out when we talk about environmental justice is that we are noticing that black and brown communities suffer the burdens and the greatest harms from extreme weather. So let's go on here. So more rain and severe storms. So we're just gonna focus on the Northeast. In the past 50 years, over 50% more rain has been present in the top 1% of a, of a, rain, a rainstorm in the last 50 years. A 90% increase in the number of five year rain events. So, every, so those big major storms that happen once every five years around here, they're becoming more frequent and the, it likely increases the frequency and severity of hurricanes. I want to talk about Sandy, if you will. Uh, Sandy, all, all, it hit Boston, but the damage would have been, or the outside areas of Boston, the damages would have been much more severe if it had hit Boston at high tide. Uh, it missed the high tide by four hours. Uh, or otherwise, Sandy would have uh, caused major damage and flooding to, 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 to Boston. So frequency changes. The frequency of heavy downpour rains is projected to increase. The most intense storms will likely increase in frequency and severity. But check this out, y'all. There is also an increased risk for drought in the summer and fall. I want to point out something here. I mentioned Hurricane Sandy, but we can see the damages. The Vermont from her tropical storm, Irene. We can see Seaside Heights, New Jersey after Superstorm Sandy leaves a level of devastation. Sea level rise. The global sea level rise has risen eight, century, eight inches over the last century. It is predicted that an increase of one to four feet of sea level rise by 2100, and up to eight feet, depending on emissions level. I want to parenthetically interject this with the science on climate change. There's a lot of tipping points. So that's why it may be, we could see up to this many days of hot, of hot weather. We could see this many uh, uh, level of sea rise because it depends on how much we continue at the same pace in which we are depending on fossil fuels, coal, and gas. So when we think of climate change and science at its most is just predicting, but there is what's called a lot of tipping points. The Northeast is projected to see higher than, level, uh, higher than average sea level rise. Check this out, y'all. Uh, again, we try to cater to our visual learners. This is a picture of Boston. 
This is a picture of Boston after two point, two point Celsius degrees and three point percent Fahrenheit warming. And Boston after four point degrees Celsius, or four degrees Celsius and seven point two Fahrenheit. So you start to see that there's a drastic difference of more things underwater. Interestingly enough, Boston is a city that is on landfill. And I know maybe some of you in here have been to the Seaport District. Very nice area. Unfortunately, in the next 20 to 30 years, depending on the tipping points, maybe longer, it will be completely eradicated because the sea level rise will swallow it up. The question then therefore becomes, well, why would people want to create that as a playpen if it's going to be totally eradicated in the next 50, in the next 20 to 50 years? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, we have to look at policymakers. And I know you all aren't from the School of Public Policy, but, but if we were to tie this into policy, we would think about, okay, policy implication. Who does it hurt? Who does it harm? How can we be influential in public policy matters? Constitution read that we, the people. Now, I know that was a contradiction back then because when the Constitution was written, it was written by white men, landowners, and it excluded people of color, women, and everyone that wasn't white, male, or landowner. So when, it, when we look at the Constitution, we the people, we know inherently there is a contradiction. But uh, we, we, we have to, I think we should understand that uh, in order to for, form a more perfect union, we're we going to have to work this thing out. In order to have more just and sustainable and equitable policies, it de a democracy depends on its citizenry to be more actively mobilized and engaged and showing up at the places of power, showing up and having a seat at the table where decisions are made with, with when policies are passed that have implications on towns, cities, and communities. Oh, okay, all right. So I guess I didn't want to overwhelm y'all too much, so we didn't add another slide, but I want to just talk a little bit, and then I think we can go to the Q&A. Uh, uh, so, the question is, how is climate change related to hurricanes? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Because the, the environment, the atmosphere is warming up uh, and, it's and it's becoming, becoming more hotter, warmer air holds more moisture. So when hurricanes are going through bodies of water, through the ocean, they're getting stronger because, the, because of the warming of the water. And then, then as it's getting stronger, when it hits land, it's going to be more deadly, dangerous, and disastrous. Uh, so there is a correlation. But I just wanted to briefly touch about what we do at CREW. So those are the climate impacts. So after we share with people what they are, and after, after we done told folks, we done told folks this is going to happen. Well, one of the aspects that we do and I mentioned it earlier about distributing energy efficient air conditioners, it's really a catch-22. While we distribute energy efficient brand new air conditioners, they're also emitting carbon. Wouldn't it be ideal if we could install uh, mini splits into people's homes? I don't see a mini split in here, it's central air, but mini splits are much more efficient, doesn't put any carbon in the air, uh, but much more expensive than ACs. Uh, and I mentioned, and I mentioned just the relevancy of the work here. So I mentioned these areas. So, so over the summer, I did mention the areas that we had our workshops. And a lot of the areas, a lot of the areas, Manapan, Dorchester, the South End, they reside, you see the South End right here, they reside in the urban heat island. And it also consequently, is also connected to low-income communities. So oftentimes, we'll go, we'll do workshops on heat, we'll raffle off ACs, we'll provide as much as we can language interpretation, because the reality of it is, 
that when we think of community engagement, I think we have to think of we have to think how to get underrepresented groups to the table. And oftentimes what we do is we work with organizations that are already in the community. For instance, we work with an organization, uh, the, the, the Cotman Square Neighborhood uh, uh, Development Corporation, when we had our event in June. There is a documentary, if you're interested in watching, uh, ABC did come and film, and it is public. Uh, uh, ABC here is Channel 5. So Channel 5 came and filmed the event, and they actually did a three-part series on climate justice. Uh, if you do go to the website, you can find under the media links, you can see that. Or uh, if you Google climate justice documentary in Boston, it came out in July, part one, part two, part three. Uh, so ABC came out to document our community engagement. Because I think you all are privileged to be here, and it's while you're here getting your education, I think it's critical to think about what you're learning here, whether maybe some of you are in grad school, or, or, or what you learn either in undergrad or graduate school here, how do you go make your impact into the world? It was uh, Howard Thurman who said, do not ask the question what the world needs, I'm paraphrasing, uh, but he, he said, do not ask, essentially, do not ask the question what the world needs, in, in one sense, but what the world needs is people to come alive and go do what they're passionate about. Uh, so really, I stopped by this beautiful building to remind someone that climate change is real, that the effects are felt, and we will continue to deal with this uh, existential issue, but all hope ought not to be lost. You know, I come from the black church, so while we, we and, and this crowd is a little bit more fire than the, the black church, but that's quite all right. Normally we're, we're hearing some amens and hallelujahs and all that wonderful stuff. But, uh, but essentially, the reality of it is, as having a seat here, what you learn, what you obtain, not only for a career, but how do you leave your contribution into the world? How can we make the world a better place? How can we mobilize? How can we organize? How can we be the best that we can be? How can we self-actualize? as Abraham Maslow talked about. And that's the question that you have to ask yourself. Now, while all of us may have different passions in this room, and while, you, while we may all feel called to different careers or, or different ideas of what we think our career, what you think your career may be or was or is, I think the reality of it is that I think we should all figure out how to be good Samaritans to one another. Uh, and I think really that's the pressing question in life is how can we help someone travel in this journey, uh, traveling along this journey? So when we think about extreme weather, when we think about the effects of extreme weather, social connections uh, is really is what will help withstand and to fight off and, and, well, to, and to reduce the level of devastation that extreme weather presents uh, in terms of human casualties. While we cannot stop hurricanes that will come, tornadoes that will come, heat waves that will get longer, snowstorms that will become more intense. I think what we can do is figure out how to know our neighbors uh, and how to stay connected to our neighbors. Because at the end of the day, uh, your neighbor could be the person that saves your life, right? Your neighbor, or you could be the person that saves your neighbor's life. Because we do have people that are more vulnerable, uh, folks with uh, pre-existing conditions such as cardiac issues or, or or elderly folks, young children that are more susceptible to the dangerous effect of extreme heat. Uh, and essentially that's what we are about at CRU, education, service, and planning. And, and, and also mobilizing people and helping people understand that we are all interconnected. It was Dr. King who said, that we are tie, all tied in an inescapable garment of mutuality. What affects one directly affects us all indirectly. For I cannot be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And then when you are what you ought to be, then we can be together, y'all. Um, and that's what the world is calling us, to be together, to be the best that we can. Uh, so I didn't mean to go off on a tangent there, but I'm going to put a pin on it right here. So that we've, I'm sure we've got some, some questions and somebody... Maybe asking the question in their mind, well, how long is this going to take? But I'm really so glad you, you asked. And really, the answer is uh, we'll be finished as soon as we're done. 
and then when we're done, that's when we would be finished. But we, I think we are ready. However, I think we're ready to transition to the next phase, uh, Dr. Landmark, and uh, take some questions, right? So I'm going to hand this mic to you, and I'll grab a seat over here. Oh, no, Is that no, all right? We'll, get, we'll both go over. Oh, yeah, we'll both go over here. All right. Should we grab two mics or one? Two. All right. Thank you, Doctor. I'm trying to turn that on. So at most of the presentations that I get to on climate change and climate justice, uh, the presenters don't look like us. Mm -hmm. Could you say a little bit about how you got into this field? I mean, I think we understand why, but how, how did you come to this place? Mm -hmm. oh, that's a great question. So how I got involved in the climate movement, uh, so I'm originally from Philadelphia. I came up to, to go to graduate school over at BU, which is not too far. Uh, and then after graduation, I stayed in the area and I began to participate in organizing. Uh, so for a bit there, I was able to organize around the fight for 15, which $15 will be the minimum wage next year. So there's a coalition called the Raise Up Coalition uh, that, that helped bring that about. Uh, and now they're, they're, if you have been paying attention to the political world, the millionaire's tax, I don't know how many people are familiar with that ballot question. Uh, the, ra uh, the Raise Up campaign is also responsible for trying to help get that passed, which the millionaire tax is uh, would tax those who make a million dollars more or more in Massachusetts at a higher rate. So with that extra money, it can go into infrastructure, education, uh, and transportation. I don't know how many of y'all know, but we need, we need the T fixed, because it certainly is broken. And we don't need any more fires on the T. So now, I digress for a second. So let me come back to answer your question succinctly and with as much brevity as I can. Uh, I got into this movement, y'all, uh, in 2018. Uh, I read the UN report. Oh, so, so to back up, so previous, previous to doing environmental justice work, I was doing organizing with the Poor People's Campaign, uh, which uh, Martin Luther King had restarted the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, he had started the Poor People's Campaign in 1968, and then unfortunately he was assassinated. But in 2017, uh, William Barber, uh, Dr. Reverend Bill William Barber and uh, uh, Liz Theo Harris, uh, Reverend Liz Theo Harris, restarted the Poor People's Campaign. And it's still going on. And what they said was uh, that these issues are connected. So Dr. King's issues, of militarism, racism, and poverty, he viewed it in 1967 as interconnected. And we ought to tackle these issues together. So when, so almost 50 years later, the Poor People Campaign relaunched, but it added environmental devastation and changing the moral distorted narrative. So that was, so being involved with the Poor People's Campaign uh, helped me understand the intersectionality of climate and racial justice climate and housing justice, climate and indigenous justice. This was also in 2018, a little bit before I read the United Nations report, the IPCC report, that says essentially that we have 12 years to slow this, to slow our reliance down on fossil fuels, coal and gas, or we're gonna see many more events like Hurricane Katrina. So it was after that and some soul searching that I wanted to figure out, because there was, how could I get more involved in the environmental movement? Because like you said, there's not a lot of black and brown folks in the environmental movement. Historically, the environmental movement has been white-led, middle class. Uh, and if you go back a little further, uh, the, you know, people really started paying attention in the 60s to the environment, particularly white middle class, when there was a fire on the river at the Chatt Chatt Chattanooga River in Cleveland, Ohio. Speaking of oxymorons or thinking about oxymorons, how does a river catch fire, right? Water and fire don't mix. Normally water just gets the best. But this river, this river was on fire in 1969 uh, as I began to study the history of the environmental movement. And, and, and I began to search, uh, and, and I didn't really see many faces of color in the movement. Uh, one face that I will mention is uh, someone uh, uh, who is often affectionately referred to 
uh, as the uh, father of environmental justice, Robert Bullard. Uh, he, you know, was one of the prominent figures in, envi in the environmental justice movement. And there's a lot of folks in the White House now that are folks of color that are on uh, President Biden's Environmental Justice Council. Uh, but for me, as a, a person of faith and, and, uh, and, and understanding and, and coming to a deeper understanding of environmental stewardship and understanding uh, the connection between environmental stewardship and care creation and trying to be good stewards of the earth, uh, this all, that all helped me get, become more deeper, more entrenched in the environmental movement. But uh, that, that report is what really was the seminal moment, if you will. <clears throat> that was the seminal moment for me to get involved into the environmental movement. So you come out of the, uh, or continue to be a part of the faith community uh, you're protecting communities and, and community health and the like. Talk a little bit about the challenges of trying to organize in black and brown communities where a lot of the issues are not uh, necessarily perceived to be uh, uh, of as uh, pressing impact as might be uh, the case of uh, employment or affordable housing or uh, criminal justice. Uh, yeah, so I mentioned a little earlier about the intersectionality of climate change. So from my experience, we, we uh, crew, we've done these workshops over the last several years in, 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 uh, in many different places, but uh, in communities of color. And what we spend a lot of time doing is helping people understand how their quality of life is impacted by climate change. If the air is poisoned, if the power plant is right down the street from you and toxins are continually being poured into the air, the cancer rate goes up in the community. If diesel bus fuel is continually being breathed in by people in a given community, such as uh, Nubian Square, and there's a lot of folks who are fighting around that, uh, including an organization called ACE, then the cancer rate goes up. Uh, so. What I often tell, share with my white colleagues is not that black and brown people don't care about environmental issues, is that when you have a thousand other things on your plate, it's kind of hard to conceptualize how climate is impacting you. For instance, if a person is struggling to rub two nickels together and they're just trying, barely getting by, paycheck to paycheck, uh, and we know that the pandemic the pandemic has caused a lot of jobs to shut down, has caused a lot of people to lose gainful employment, has caused, unfortunately, a lot of people to, to die. Um, we know that when, the, when, and even speaking of COVID, those who disproportionately suffered the most at COVID, from COVID uh, during, the, during the years when there was no vaccine, it was black and brown communities, communities like Chelsea, uh, where the, the death rates were astronomical because you had folks living in house, substandard housing uh, together and folks who were what we didn't consider essential workers uh, gro working with the public now became essential workers like grocery worker, grocery store workers, employees. Uh, so we, we spent a lot of time thinking about, and, and when we're talking with communities of color, we try to, and folks of color, we try to lay out that your concern about police brutality is real. Your concern about racial profiling is real or getting racially profiled is real. Your concern about getting falsely arrested and falsely accused is real. Your concern about experiencing microaggressions and blatant racism is real. And those issues should not be trivialized. We just try to help people understand that what climate, what, you, what people may think of climate change effects 100 years from now is happening now. And we try to point out this is what is happening. Uh, if you go to uh, our website, we have a blog. One of our former interns on the summer, uh, she wrote a blog about growing up in Arkansas and how her and her family will prepare for hurricanes. Uh, so it is real, it is pressing. And it's interconnected. And that's one of the reasons why we do intersectionality panels. 
so we have videos of, again, if you go to our website, our YouTube channel, you'll see videos of us working with uh, Dougley, oh no, that's not recorded, but um, I, I, we, we, we work with immigrant organizations and we talked about how these things are interconnected. And so for us, our engagement strategy rests on the idea that we don't go in and just tell folks what they ought to do, but let us co-design how we can prepare together. Because it's not us, it's not us as crew saying, y'all got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. But no, we want to help bring people along so they can understand why it is that we're suggesting to do this. And you know, keep those other issues in mind, you know, uh, racial justice, indigenous justice, surviving, going uh, hunger, you know, uh, you know, so a lot of folks in black and brown communities suffer from a lot more issues than just worrying about the, uh, the urban heat island, for instance. So let me ask one more question that will open it up to uh, the class and, and our audience. Um, a lot of the mitigation Mm -hmm. uh, that is needed at this point is going to require that uh, homeowners and renters in black and brown communities in particular um, may be called upon to make very significant investments mm -hmm. uh, in their homes and communities. You know, uh, heat pumps will cost $10,000 and up. Uh, solar panels. The solar panels uh, mm -hmm. uh, are expensive, and folks just don't have that kind of money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the question is, how do you mobilize people through education and through organizing uh, to uh, adapt to the idea that there's going to be a big investment called for? And um, when you lay that out, how do people respond to that? Well, I, I, off, so although we don't do solar panels, we, we are connected to organizations that will, that will pit solar panels on people's homes for free, but with the condition that they have to keep it for 25 years. However, the solar panel will be saving on their energy bill. Uh, so while, while it is uh, that we ourselves are not you know, push, strongly advocating that, we do give space at our events for organizations that do solar panel, that focus on solar panel, to come to, to talk about that. Uh, and, you know, I recently, last week, I was meeting with some uh, major union leaders uh, from one union, and we were talking about green jobs. And, you know, and this union represents uh, carpentry, like building trades. Coal, uh, well, not many coal miners here in Massachusetts, but you know a lot of the jobs uh, that people have are in the service industry that are uh, predicated on dirty jobs or dirty energy jobs. And one of the concerns was that their workers uh, will not be able to get trained in time or get trained at a fast enough rate or make a higher rate if they go to a green energy job, like clean energy, like a clean, like thermal, uh, thermal energy, uh, uh, clean wind and solar, solar, et cetera. So I think it is multifaceted when we think about the mitigation and how it impacts people's jobs. And, you know, the government, I mean, obviously President Biden the inf uh, has, was instrumental in helping the infrastructure bill pass, which will dump a lot of money into retrofitting and a lot of money into transforming roads and a lot of and money for electric cars and rebates on electric cars. But what we're finding is that union jobs are good. And however, when we talk to the electrician or when we talk to uh, folks from the build plumbers, folks from the building trades, when we talk to the leadership, they're hesitant to embrace and even though crew doesn't push this adamantly, but they're hesitant, they're, hesitant, they're hesitant to embrace the green job concept because it's not paying a livable wage like this particular union job that this you know, person X has been in for the last 10, 15 years. Uh, so I think that's another challenge, which obviously is a challenge that we, we don't, ourselves don't tackle at crew, but it is a very pressing challenge. Uh, because, and I think that faces the wider climate change movement, especially those on adaptation. Uh, I mean, especially those on mitigation. Like, how can we get the buy-in, not only from the politician, 
Uh, even we have a mayor here in Boston that believes in the Green New Deal. There's a new Green New. There's a new Green New Deal. There's a new new. There's a, 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 a you, there is someone that just hired that has the Green New Deal position in Boston. Uh, so the city is trying to implement a Green New Deal in all this in all its facets. Um, so I think it's multi it's multi complex. So to really re so to think about it, how and there is an organization called Brown in the Green Space. Uh, Y'all can Google them. They they are interested in helping get Black and Brown people clean energy jobs. Like you know, environment and, and Black and Brown communities have uh, suffered the harms of ex of, of uh, climate change. How can they benefit from the goods? You know, these clean energy jobs. So I, I think that. Uh, it has been a slow process of uh, getting in full investment. I think when we talk about giving out air, air conditioners and we talk about you know, cooling kits and whatnot, it's, uh, it's an easy act, especially uh, what we try to do is when we go into different communities, we actually get, we order catering from local restaurants because we want to support black and brown businesses and local businesses. Uh, but it has gone at a rate where I think people are paying attention because one day is 60 degrees, another day is 30 degrees, the next day is 90 degrees, the next day is 100 degrees. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I think extreme, I think the weather is catching more people of, uh, it's catching more people's attention, especially with the reoccurrence of hurricanes and tornadoes and heat waves, et cetera. So folks can see it and feel it. Let's let's go to uh, questions from the class or, or comments. Thank you so much for coming. First of all, I really appreciate your presentation. Um, so I had a quick question, and you and you talked you touched on it a little bit um, regarding people that are financially struggling. Um, not caring about climate change, or at least, you know, having other priorities, um, like, you know, basic living necessities. Um, so, in, I'm from Vermont, by the way, and I appreciated your Irene picture living through that, that storm. Um, but in Vermont, in my hometown, you know, we've been coined the solar capital of New England. You know, we've made these investments in the solar and other green alternatives. Um, and the community was behind those, those you know, actions because we invested in social programs and healthcare and all these other you know, necessities for life for years before you know, we started doing solar and other green alternatives. So my question for you is, how do you and your organization and policymakers in general balance um, investing in like short-term social programs? Um, so like putting up a giant size skyscraper in a city that you know, is already suffering from like, you know, heat waves, right? How do you balance that investing in short-term economic gains that also harm the environment um, in the long term? Uh, well, I think it is, a, thank you for that question and thank you for providing uh, more context of where, where, where you come from. It is a pressing challenge uh, because, you know, for us, if we can save lives, and we mentioned about the, the, the heat and, and how deadly heat is, uh, we do need investment into retrofitting, and we do need the investments into more solar panels. Uh, we also need investment into, uh, we also need investment into ensuring that people have the basic necessities they need to survive, and also the basic information needed to survive extreme weather. Now, I know the city of Boston has a department called Climate Ready Boston, and they spend a lot of time you know, uh, in, in different neighborhoods in the city uh, uh, assessing, the damp assessing the threats that extreme weather poses to different neighborhoods. Like, for instance, Dorchester, Marcy Boulevard, and Gallivan Boulevard, they flood pretty often, where you have places in Roxbury that don't don't flood as much. So I think for us, while our, so the other program that I, that I talked about that's under the Better Future Project is uh, 350 Massachusetts, 350 Mass. Uh, they focus a lot on the long-term solutions, and they focus a lot on political advocacy, 
they focus a lot on uh, applying uh, and working and, and being in coalition with other environmental justice groups around, uh, around here in Boston. And they, they're focusing on the long term. Uh, I think for us, so far our model has included that we need to get folks help right now. You know, we need to get folks, especially in the summertime, we need to get folks resources right now, well, you know, summertime. Or even in the wintertime, like we, we mentioned we have flood kits. We need to get these resources to folks now uh, because they're probably not thinking about 30, 40 years from now. And then we try to also find ways to be in partnership with those who are advocating for longer term solutions, such as more green space, you know, and advocating for seawalls and advocating for mangroves. And, you know, and these are forms of climate resilience. Uh, so I think it is a, it's a balance that, we've, uh, that we're working on and, and we try to do as much as we can to try to, you know, think long term in a sense of working with government. You know, we, we have people on our staff that have testified at hearings and city hearings and state hearings about the need for uh, investment now into getting resources into underserved communities. Thank you for the question. Yeah, the other thing is that uh, the choices don't have to be either or, they can be both and. That is mm -hmm. to say, someone is gonna need to install those panels. Mm -hmm. uh, someone is gonna need the skill set for retrofitting triple deckers. Uh, someone is gonna need to know how to uh, do planting and horticultural work that will uh, survive urban environments. Um, and as long as we um, have uh, uh, labor policies and practices that um, encourage those jobs to go to people who commute in from southern New Hampshire um, or from Rhode Island, uh, you know, you, you look at the pickup trucks uh, that we see uh, all over the city. Uh, owned by the construction workers, if, if the goal is in part to raise the standard of living through employment uh, of people in the city, it makes sense to then uh, provide workforce development and training for people who live in the city and who are going to benefit from uh, uh, that kind of work. Um, and, and so at the same time you're talking about employing um, uh, folks uh, within the communities uh, and training them, you are also talking about long-term benefits uh, for the communities and for their kids. Other questions or comments? Yes, up in the back. You, uh, oh, is this on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you said early in the talk that one of the main obstacles, um, I'll just first off, thank you very much for speaking. Uh, it was a really, really uh, interesting and enthralling talk. Um, but you said very early on that one of the main obstacles to addressing climate change was the politicization and partisanship that almost defined the issue. And I was wondering what you thought the main strategy was to try and work around uh, how partisan this issue has become and how you can either work with or work around the people um, whose direct interests may be harmed by the same thing that we need to do to help solve climate change. Yes, thank you so much for that question. Uh, so in my role at Crew, we try to stay nonpartisan. We try to just present and focus on extreme weather. However, I am a part of the, uh, the, the state Sierra Club here as the, uh, the vice chair of the political committee. So in that role, we, so, we, so for candidates that are running, uh, we evaluate a ba uh, basically a lot of, we send them a questionnaires for incumbents and candidates and, and challengers. Uh, and we evaluate their answers based off the priorities of the Sierra Club. So, for crew, we kind of look at ourselves as entry into the climate justice movement. We kind of, because we want to attract people 
who might not be mo who might not be incentivized to come to a meeting to learn about the the political divide which, uh, uh, the political divide of the climate change conversation, but they might be but they are motivated to come to a meeting to learn about potential well to learn to to potentially win an air conditioner, potentially win a cooling uh, to get well to get a cooling kit and also so a free free meal. So so for us we. The, so how I try to, so in my crew role, what we try to do is we try we testify when we're when we're asked uh, to to by uh, government officials to come and te to testify. We have written op-eds with uh, progressive uh, elected officials. I'm thinking about a city council in Cambridge. We we wrote an op-ed last year with uh, in uh, Commonwealth Magazine, uh, Quentin Zondervan. Um, and uh, Common, Commonwealth Magazine is like a political think tank, you know, like your political insiders here in Massachusetts. Read Commonwealth Magazine, it's an online magazine. Uh, so, and, and, and in that particular article, we, uh, we advocated for investment into underserved communities. Uh, so I think it is, uh, so for me, you know, early on at Crew, I tried to adopt the practice of not really focusing on the partisan issue. Because I'll give you an example. We have talked to Republicans, we've talked to Democrats, we have talked to uh, independents, uh, in, in, in those who are registered independents. And I think if we focus on our political divide, then we may just be further pulled apart because of political leadership across our country that believes that climate change is a hoax and it is asinine and it's made up. But the, the hook that we use to try to draw people in is, is, particularly when they're there already, but to keep them, is to talk about weather and how this, what this looks like in your community. Let's make it real every day. Let's make it real how this is impacting. When we, when we deal with communities that have toxic, that have chemical plants or power plants near, we often will go into the cancer rate. We'll talk about the health of the community and how this particular substation, like for instance, in East Boston, there is a substation that's supposed to be getting built. And if, you, if you're not familiar with a substation, substations are providing electricity for the area. However, they're prone to f explode when it rains, and, and substations have exploded. So there's a groundswell of support and resistance against uh, from the community and community organizations in East Boston against uh, the, the government, state government, and, and those who have given the permit for the company to come and build the substation to build it. And it's been stalled for the last couple of years because the substation is right across from a playground. Um, so so there is, it is an interesting way to, to navigate it, uh, but it's uh, no easy task. But in my crew role, I try not to get too deep politically. Mm -hmm. So, We've reached the end of our time. Oh, we have. And and uh, oh, time flies. <laughs> time does fly, and and um, I wonder, in speaking to a, a group of um, students who are heading off into a variety of different careers, mm -hmm. uh, some will do uh, some level of community organizing. Some are going into business. Some are in. Uh, the health field, mm -hmm. some are in, in public policy, will go into government agencies, uh, some will do finance, a, a range of different things. Um, not everyone here is necessarily going to be uh, a uh, climate change professional. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, wh what's the advice you would provide to a group like this in terms of how they can continue uh, to have uh, an active role uh, in addressing these kinds of issues, particularly as these issues may impact uh, communities that aren't necessarily like the communities they may have grown up in? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. I think one way to stay involved is to look up the local environmental organizations in your community. Look, to look up the, the nonprofits, to look up the government agencies, and maybe to subscribe to their email list, particularly for the nonprofits, and social sector organizations, and figure out if there's something if you, you, that might call you to action. 
in your spare time. You know, something that might you might get passionate or signing a petition. A lot of times, uh, organizations will send around a petition. Will email a petition to their uh, folks who are subscribed to their email list. And it might just be as simple as signing a petition. It might just be as simple as sharing something on your social media to raise awareness uh, to your social network about the, the, the issues related to climate change. Uh, and I think we all do have a role to play in this gigantic puzzle. And I think it takes all of us. You know, I think it takes all of us to do our little part in figuring out, one, how we can reduce our own carbon footprint, but also looking for ways and opportunities to volunteer, looking for ways or opportunity to support those who are in the climate profession, uh, whether that's just signing a petition, whether that's just sharing something on social media, whether that's going to an action, because a lot of climate organizations have, especially a lot of the organizations that do mitigation work, uh, they have rallies uh, down at the state house and all types of political action. So I think that finding wherever you wherever you go off at, wherever city you live in, uh, finding climate organizations that are on the ground and then signing up for their email list and just being abreast of what they have going on so that you might find a way to plug in uh, where you could still have your career whether it's finance, business, uh, law, government, et cetera, still do your career uh, because the world needs the particular gifts that you have. And you, and you might have a gift that excels in a particular field. Uh, but I also think that just being aware of what opportunities there are to participate in your local uh, community around a neighborhood cleanup, for instance, a park cleanup. You know, there are organizations that, uh, that, that organize, uh, YMCA, for, for instance, uh, neighbor, uh, park cleanups, uh, neighborhood cleanups. So even just your little part, I think, can help. Recycling, and even though that's just a small, small part in, in a global problem, I think it certainly do, does help. Thanks. I think that's really helpful. Um, We'll be back with the open classroom next week. And, and uh, my thanks to you, Reverend, for coming in and sharing your insights into community organizing and reaching out into uh, communities that, that generally um, have not been actively involved in this field up to now. So thanks a lot. Oh, thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you all. Appreciate you, brother. Absolutely. Oh, man, that's wonderful.